It's time now to introduce our keynote speaker. Distinguished Professor Paul Spoonley was until recently the Pro Vice Chancellor of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Massey University. He's the author or editor of 27 books, the most recent being Rebooting the Regions 2016. He's currently writing two books, one on social and demographic change in New Zealand, while the other concerns the extreme right in this country. He's a program leader of a research program on the impacts of immigration and diversity in Aotearoa with a funding of $5.5 million. He was made a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand in 2011 and was granted the title of Distinguished Professor by Massey University in 2013. He was awarded the Science and Technology Medal by the Royal Society in 2009 and he was a Fulbright Senior Scholar at the University of California, Berkeley in 2010. And since 2013, he has been a visiting researcher at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity in Gottingen, Germany, most recently in 2019. It gives me great pleasure <laughs> to now invite distinguished Professor Paul Spoonley to the stage as tonight's keynote speaker with his talk title, Hate Speech, What Have We Learned Since 15 March and What Can We Do Now? I was just going to say, um, what kind of traction do you think parties like New Conservatives are, are getting? And um, it's, it's noteworthy as well that, that the sort of line that um, that party is running is very um, anti-Indigenous rights as well. Um, in terms of, of removal of Maori seats and a whole lot of other constitutional processes. Yeah. I, can I begin this one, Anjum? I, um, I had a debate with the deputy leader of the New Conservatives, who seemed quite charming. Um, however, some of the New Conservative supporters who turned up are rather shocked me in terms of their very direct and what I would call um, racism. And, and so there's, there's a, my concern is that those parties and including the um, New Zealand Public Party with Billy Te Kahika are speaking to a constituency in New Zealand and, and part of that speech is both a traditional anti-Semitism and a more contemporary Islamophobic um, commentary narrative that's running through that. And then it's combined with views that somehow the New Zealand government and the Prime Minister represent um, or are influenced by Chinese communism. So there's a, there's a whole um, span of arguments which link together dots in a way that is um, deeply conspiratorial and which expresses a, a very narrow form and a very exclusive form of nationalism. And, and I find that deeply worrying. But we saw a rally in support of Hezbollah on Queen Street in, 2000 and, in 2018. So I want, to, I want to turn now to the politicisation of migration and, and refugee resettlement, which we're seeing in, in the media currently in the lead up to the election and, and what you've just spoken about as, as part of that, uh, with groups like the New Conservatives and um, in comments that have been made by members of the opposition about, for instance, Baru's Bachani gaining re refugee status in New Zealand. Can you both, uh, would you like to comment on that? Well, what I'll say is this is certainly not anything new yeah. in terms of the political rhetoric. So I think the worst, you know, we, we've had waves of it. So if we look back into the 1970s and that, that wave of um, anti-Pacifica rhetoric and the scare tactics used in that election, but literally it goes back well before that into, if you look at some of the cartoons in the early 1900s, uh, um, you know, in the early 20th century and so on, that 
that the China, the yellow peril and the threat from the mm. Chinese and the, you know this has been a consistent part of the political sphere. When you look at the response to the Christchurch mosque attacks, the very immediate and strongest response was from Naitahu, and they were incredibly valuable in terms of the work that they did and are continuing to do mm -hmm. in that space. So, you know, as you say, I think it's certainly wider than immigration, but it's more than just being kaitiakitanga in terms of um, or, you know, manakitanga in terms of welcoming us, I think we really need to talk about those fundamental issues of how we share power and how our power structures and our constitutional systems are set up that favour a particular cultural view that comes from a continent that is not New Zealand. And, and I've see, heard this said in other spaces, so I'm quoting to some extent, but we're an island nation of the Pacific. And we need to start working that way and setting things up that work for us and it's interesting when you look at the COVID response and hear the Prime Minister say well actually we've got the best response and we've got our response we don't actually need to look at what overseas people are doing um, and mimic it we we know how to do our response here for us and so I think we need to get over that hangover that we have to be wedded to a Westminster system, that we have to be wedded to structures and institutions that um, don't even serve those countries well, let alone our country. Can I just talk generally for a second? Um, in response to the question about systemic racism, absolutely. So we're talking about structural advantage and disadvantage. I think Black Lives Matter is a very interesting moment, and it's going to be interesting to see what it delivers. So it's a, a moment when we sensitize communities around the world, not simply in, in America. But what strikes me about Black Lives Matter is that it doesn't necessarily speak to the immigrant or minority ethnic and religious community experiences necessarily. And the other thing is that quite often when we talk about systemic racism, we need to offer hope. We need to be able to say, what should happen in a way that allows all of us to move on rather than creating at times guilt or um, anxiety or what, um, what D'Angelo calls white fragility. Yeah. And I just want to speak to that for a moment because, you know, some of, the, some of the ways in which we couch what the issue is and some of the ways in which we then seek to invite other people to the party, to the discussion, and then to move to um, some to address in some way structural advantage and disadvantage needs Pākehā in the room. And I've got um, um, uh, Rennie Eldo Lodge's book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. Well, so I'm, I'm thinking, why don't I write a book saying why I am talking to white people about race as a Pākehā <laughs> talking to the yeah. Pākehā? Yeah. To say that this is, this is an issue that you should be involved with and you shouldn't um, take yourself out of the conversation and you shouldn't feel as though you are being attacked personally, that we need your participation in this because it's not going to occur if it only involves Maori or the Muslim community. Yeah. Um, it really does need the people in positions of power and influence yeah. to be part of that debate. Yes. So I think Black Lives Matter is a, is a, a wonderful moment of digital activism yeah. when we can see in real time what's happening and then and begin to mobilise people. But what concerns me most is how do you then involve those who are in positions of power? How do you begin to address questions of institutional um, uh, process? And, and how do you begin to identify what we should be moving towards. Yeah, that's that's a very a very good um, note to to end on. I feel like with that kind of uh, positioning of Pakia versus everyone else, I always try to think of the ideal as being Māori and everyone else, because Māori are they're kind of the only unique kind of aspect of New Zealand that really needs to be upheld um, if we are to move forward. And I think there just needs to be more solidarity. Mm.